Now it is my pleasure to um, introduce my colleague Hilke Plasma. Again, part of all this futuristic stuff is not only do you have to do stuff rapidly, but you also have a bit of a vision where things are going. Hilke joined INSEAD 10 years ago. She was one of the very early marketing researchers to see the potential that's now widely accepted around neurosciences and has really become a world expert on sort of neurosciences and decision making, especially in the marketing context. And what we're seeing here is AI, big important new technology, and really lots of people have to ask, how does this interact with what we look at? And for Hilke, what's the connection between neuroscience and AI? Hilke Plasma. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Also, thank you very much for the other organizers, such as uh, Pascal and Bruno, for having me here. Uh, it's a super exciting uh, day, I think, and I'm very excited to be here and share with you some of my thoughts on the relationship between neuroscience, AI, and how we can leverage this for better business applications. Um, now, um, the one thing I want to uh, just say, I will use some examples. I just want to declare that I have no conflict of interest whatsoever. I'm not part of the board of any of these companies and so forth. I just think that these are cool examples, or maybe not so much. Um, and then um, also um, maybe the first thing I would like to start with is you see a bit that I'm in some ways uh, a bit the odd one out on this lineup, right? So because um, I'm not an engineer working, working in, in AI, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist that teaches and researches in the intersection between neuroscience and um, decision-making research. And so the first point I would like to clarify is what is actually about this, this marriage between neuroscience and AI. And, and for some of you, this might be more obvious because in, in AI, we use ter uh, terms like um, neuronal networks and so forth. Um, but one thing that is, I think, important for me that, that this is clear is that in computational neuroscience, um, what we care about are models that are biologically plausible. Whereas in engineering and AI, um, a lot of these models, they need to work. They abstract away from this requirement that they have to be biologically plausible. Um, and now when you put these things together, this obviously already gives you an idea about why this could be a fruitful marriage of neuroscience and AI, because in some ways, um, how I see the, the models that we have on cognitive neuroscience and computational neuroscience, they can in some ways enhance the smartness of um, current um, AI, and by putting in um, uh, models that are mimicking more like we as, as humans are. Right? So when you think about, for example, robots, um, integrating, making robots more human is something that at least some of us uh, desire. So uh, putting in, plugging in something like affective computing so that they can also display emotions or are not awkward in a social way, uh, this could be something that has a cool um, application, I guess. Now, on the other hand, so I'm saying it's kind of a two-way, as every marriage, I guess, it's a, it's a two-way useful relationship, um, is that um, in neuroscience, we have been using AI algorithms a lot because we also have big data, right? So we have lots of data, uh, slightly different than the big data that you guys are used to, right? Because we have a different time scale and a different level of depth, I guess. Um, but that's why some of the examples I will show you also showcases how we can use AI to go through neuroscientific data and make better predictions about human behavior. Um, and so then Peter uh, asked me to give you a kind of a critical overview on how we can use now this intersection between neuroscience and AI for better business applications. And um, here is kind of the framework that I've uh, built for, <laughs> for this. Um, uh, and you see here kind of two uh, important axes. On the one hand, so the horizontal axis, is um, showcasing the potential of neurobiology to be in some ways a more precise measurement tool that can help us to better understand, for example, how customers react to your products or how your uh, work uh, workforce or your employers or your leaders act. Right? So, um, and um, you can think of this as, is there also, uh, yes, yes. Um, and you can, in some ways, you can think of this as something that is linked to a specific system. For example, you're interested, as I was saying earlier, you're interested in emotions, right? So you can look at your emotional systems either in the brain or maybe also on other body parts, for example, our face, right? Um, and then um, you can take this to, to a more, like a larger scale level where you look at whole brain systems, you look at certain chemicals, for example, the chemical dopamine, which is involved in 
uh, motivation and reward processing, or even other body systems. Um, one thing that I'm personally excited about in, in my research on mostly dietary decision making is this idea that our gut, for example, is its own independent nervous system, independent from our brain. Um, so, and there are also ways to capture this. I'll talk about this uh, a bit at the end. Um, that uh, would also fall in this section, right? So as a kind of a broader distributed network. And then uh, one other important thing that we shouldn't forget though is, uh, I'll not talk about this too much, um, but I want to emphasize that this is important to consider, are uh, that these activity or stuff that's happening in those systems will eventually translate into something uh, going on in our mind that we can ask our customers or our employees about, so a state of mind, so attitudes and so forth, and also then obviously it translates into behavior such as clicks and purchases. Um, one important point here really is to understand that I'm not advocating that neuroscience together with AI will replace the need for these more traditional approaches. What I'm saying is that the really cool potential is to leveraging all of these things together as complementing tools. Um, and then, um, so on the other axis, on the vertical axis, what we see here is uh, this goes into the business applications and it goes into also in some ways a level of integration of neuroscience in business applications. And what you see in gray here is mostly what um, we are doing today, which we might be doing tomorrow. When it gets to this part here, I think this is the real future potential of neuroscience and AI, where you go beyond just uh, measurement service to integrate this uh, in part of your innovations, either in form of really the, the real-time measure that neuroscience allows you to do, or in form of a model um, or some theories that you have built that you can use to make um, better products by then um, applying the big data um, and, and make this uh, uh, interesting new cool product or, or service. And so um, also one other thing to highlight, I put here some examples. This is not an exhaustive list, right? So these are just some examples, just the slide is too small and I don't, ha don't have enough time to talk about all the uh, different possibilities. Now, um, uh, so what I want to do now is to go through this framework a bit step by step to give you some, uh, some ideas on, on what we can do at the moment and, and what we will be able to do um, I think, so this is obviously colored by my, <laughs> by my opinion, in the future. Um, so the first, uh, first one here goes into this first box where this is something so we can do today, right? This is something that you see out there in the marketplace when you look at more marketing companies, how they actually leverage AI. Uh, what you see is um, uh, something like this. So a lot of uh, you will have websites, right? And an interesting question that you might have is like, I want to optimize my website the way I place my products, the way I place information. And for this, it's pivotal to understand where are actually people looking at. So this gets at the system of attention, right? So visual attention to be more precise. Um, and the old way of doing this would be displayed here. What you do is you hire a market research company. Um, they get together a bunch of participants and they will have eye trackers and uh, uh, you will, as a result, get something like this. This is a heat map. The more red this is, the more likely that people will be looking at this, right? So based on the um, empirical study that you did. Now, um, what is uh, pretty cool is uh, this one here. And you see the, uh, the first thing to notice that this heat map looks more or less similar. The difference with this one here is that um, this is not based on an empirical study. This is an algorithm that was used to run over this website. And this algorithm combines machine learning, but also it integrates um, knowledge about um, our visual system in the brain. Uh, so it knows kind of how can I predict what's what things are visually sticking out. So what will I be looking at, right? So, and, and uh, you see with a you know, decent accuracy, we can predict um, attention of, of people, right? Um, and um, uh, another example for this, where you uh, combine um, AI algorithms with, with biological markers, uh, would be this one here. I'm not sure how good or bad you can see this. So here's the idea that we know in, in neuroscience a lot about um, how we express emotions in our faces. Right? And this is kind of, in some ways, um, helps me as an unobservable way. Well, um, I can 
sample your facial emotions without needing to ask you about your emotional states, which in some situations might be something that you're interested in because um, a lot of our emotional processes are unconscious. Yeah? And for a long time, the way we need to do this is like we had uh, human coders, so people that were looking at videos, poor research assistants, I would say, uh, or PhD students that would need to code human faces. Now, uh, with the help of AI, what we can do is we can um, predict uh, using or capturing via video camera facial muscle movements, and we can make a prediction with a certain accuracy what emotion this person is, is um, experiencing at the moment. Yeah? Um, and all of these are really cool applications of neuroscience together with AI that are working very well um, at the moment and uh, that are mostly offered actually as, as market research tools or tools also to better understand, for example, again, how your employees work, do your employees pay attention, uh, as those sorts of things, or how uh, for negotiations work, obviously, uh, when the moment you're interested in emotion or attention, um, all of these tools can come in quite, quite handy. Now, there are also some tools where um, I think you have to be careful uh, when at the moment where people start telling you I can measure brain waves while you're running around in a store, um, this is something that is much more difficult and I think we're, we're not there yet actually. Now, um, uh, very quickly, um, th all of this has been now on predicting individual level behavior. Right? Um, now there's a cool trend, this has mostly been published in peer-reviewed journals, so the journals that, that I read but most of you don't read. Um, because they're quite boring to read <laughs> in some ways. Um, uh, this is, we can actually use this, rather than predicting individual level behavior, we can use this to predict market level behavior. So what do I mean with this? Let's imagine now, th so th this has been applied in lots of different domains. This is a recent paper from a co-author of mine at Stanford. Um, they were trying to get at this question whether they could predict with, with brain data uh, better than with behavioral data, would you or enough people that are on kickstarter.com and see this um, crowdfunding request, would they actually uh, you know, fund this, yes or no, and would there be enough people to actually do this? And what they have done is they have done something called a neural focus group. I don't like this term specifically, but this is kind of, I guess, what, <laughs> what people use. Um, they have put uh, 30 participants in a scanner, and they have asked them about whether they uh, they're they would fund this yes or no, but they also scanned their brains while they were doing this. Um, and then what is really uh, mind-boggling, so they used an, a classifier uh, to predict the market level success um, using the brain data, and they found that these regions here are a predictor of this. And what is interesting is that they found that this brain activity beats behavior in their prediction. Right? So they can improve the prediction by plugging this in just from a few number of people. That's why the term neural focus group. Um, this, however, um, I think this is a pretty cool, has a pretty cool potential. However, all of these papers that have been published in these boring academic journals, what they lack a bit is kind of you guys' input. So they lack a bit the um, kind of uh, tools that you and a company would actually use to, to get this. So I think their comparison with the behavior that they're using could be optimized. Uh, and this is something that I'm working on right now with some of my colleagues um, at INSEAD and also a big German retailer to try to predict and make a horse race between different methodologies, um, the success of their innovations, actually. Now, um, I want to come uh, to this last box, which I think is the future potential. Uh, and again, what is important here is to uh, understand that what I've been telling you here um, will be integrated in this one here, and I think this will kind of unravel the real potential of using neuroscience and AI for um, business applications. So um, the first uh, market where you see there's a lot of talking about using neuroscience is this idea of cognitive enhancers. I guess we all want to be smarter, right? So, and there are these products that you can buy or sort of training services you can do based on neuroscience. Uh, this one here is uh, you, you zap your brain or you stimulate your brain. Um, uh, you may perform it in, yeah, well, you, you kind of feed in electrical activity. Um, and then all of a sudden you become smarter. This is obviously something that really doesn't work this way, so <laughs> be, be careful about this. <laughs> um, <laughs> but <laughs> there's actually a lot of this out there. But um, it's, it's so versions of this um, are used, for example, to treat depression. So there's something about this idea of stimulating your brain that could work, but this will take some more time to really be something that can be commercialized and be kind of something that you can use at a broader level to just uh, enhance your cognitive functions. And there's some peer-reviewed research on this showing that this doesn't really work 
as promised. Now, um, th so the other thing I wanted to, to, sh to share is uh, uh, another way of integrating neuroscience, uh, combining this with AI and innovating um, would be something like this example here. Psymetrics is a job market search base. Um, and what they do is they, instead of uh, going over the traditional way of profiling people, they incorporate knowledge from neuroscience to have people go through a battery of tasks or games, classify them in a new way about uh, strategic thinking and leadership abilities, and then um, they match make the candidates with the companies using AI algorithms. Right? So here is an example for you have a foundation based on neuroscience um, for a new product. Uh, you combine this with AI, and I think this is a cool application. Now, um, the next one here, and this is, I think, one of the really forward-looking promises of, of AI and, and neurobiology, is this idea of, I can now tailor products, right? Um, this is not necessarily a, a new idea, but uh, now with the ability of, for example, doing real-time measures of, for example, what you see here, your blood levels, here's your blood glucose levels, you could make on the spot uh, dietary recommendations, right? Um, so you have an app, um, and if you go for lunch, it tells you, well, given your level of physical activity today um, and your blood sugar levels, you can, uh, y this is what you might want to eat in order to keep your uh, blood sugar levels um, down. Ob the obvious application for this, uh, what this is used for is diabetes, right? But you can see how this also translates into, into dieting recommendations and, and weight loss interventions. Um, last one, I see that Peter is <laughs> coming, approaching and approaching. Um, so, uh, and this is relates to back what I was saying in the beginning, how um, can neuroscience inspire machine learning? Uh, what you see here are, um, is an automated car and uh, Erica, the, the human robot, right? So, and um, what is interesting, I think, what neuroscience can add to how we have automated cars at the moment or how we have robots at the moment is that it can add this biologically plausibility into that. So for example, um, effective computing can make Erica less creepy uh, in some <laughs> ways because <laughs> um, it, it can really help her to, to act like a human. Right? Um, I'm not sure whether this makes her really less creepy, but <laughs> I think people will just think she's a human, right, mm -hmm. in some ways. And for the, for the car, right, and you know that the Googles of this world are working on this, uh, for example, if you integrate these algorithms of attention, um, it can help them obviously to improve, um, to, to uh, work really as a self-driving car. And um, uh, with that, um, I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> um, I'm not going to go through, the, through these last ones, maybe I just leave them... Uh, up, so this is a summary of what Okay, you thank you very much, Hilka. Yeah. That's great. Um, yeah, fasc fascinating interactions. Also, as we know, you know, AI is oftentimes fueling areas where analytics was already strong, and there was, you know, no, no area that analytics has had as much impact as marketing, and so it was certainly fascinating to see how that's updating practice. You guys get a break. We'll take 20 minutes. Check out the demos. If you have questions, the people in the blue lanyards can answer any and all of your questions. We'll be back here at 10.50. Thank you very much.